Specialist. Um, so first, I'd like to start off by um, <laughs> thanking our sponsors, um, MU Cell First Defense, uh, Becky Vincent, and um, Dr. Raphael. Um, and then Boringer Ingelheim is also one of our sponsors today, and we have Greg Spear with us as well. Um, I'd also like to introduce Sentara's feed team to you. So if I could have um, the members of our feed team come up. This is uh, Kelly Clayton. She's a dairy okay. consultant. She's working over in our eastern region area. And then um, Nicole Mole, she's also a dairy consultant with us, um, working locally in this area. Um, and then Andrew DeRoe is our director of feed and also does some has done some nutrition work as well. So this is our feed team. We have a couple members that are not with us today as well. So um, I also wanted to highlight our Purina partners, um, specifically on the calf side of things. They couldn't be here today. There's um, a meeting going on in St. Louis. So Robin Steiner, who some of you may know, um, and Ralph Gill. Um, I'd like to introduce Becky Vincent to come up and say our prayer before we have our meal. If you'll join with me, please, in a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to gather as fellow producers who are passionate about being good stewards of the land and animals you have placed in our care. Thank you to Dr. Lichty and Dr. Roberts who have traveled here today to share their knowledge with us. May our ears and minds be open that we might use some of what we learn here today. In a world where so many are hungry, we thank you for the farmers that produce our food, those that have prepared it, and those that will serve it. May it be nourishment to our bodies, we might continue to do your will. Be with each one here today, keeping them safe as they travel home. And for these things, we praise you and thank you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, they're planning to bring out food around 1130 ish so I'm going to just continue with my little bit of a presentation that I'm going to give you guys um, and I guess if they start bringing out the food then you just go ahead and eat while I'm talking that's okay all right okay so um, we want you to feel like Sentara is more than just your feed company. Um, we want you to look at us as your partner um, that helps you um, with other services um, and other consulting um, things as well. Um, there's four things that I'm going to touch on as priorities to be productive. Um, I think these are things you should pay attention to in your CAF program. Um, starting with colostrum, we all know that that's a huge importance to calves, right? So if we don't get that step done right, we miss a lot of opportunity with our calves' health. So just some things to point out, colostrum from vaccinated dams would be my preference. Um, testing your colostrum for quality with a Briggs refractometer uh, we'd like to see a 22, um, 24 or higher would be even better. Um, getting four quarts of that colostrum into your calves in the first 12 hours, obviously the sooner the better. Um, and then also offering a second feeding of colostrum. Reading the labels on colostrum is important. Um, we want you to look for a product with a minimum of 100 grams of IgGs in a dose. And the higher the concentration, the better. So say we have 100 grams in a pack 
it's 470 grams versus 100 grams of IgG in a pack that's 700 grams. Yeah, the first one would be the better pick. Um, we want you to look, make sure that there is colostral fat. 20% colostral fat is ideal. Um, pay attention to some colostrum companies remove that colostral fat and replace that with some alternative fat sources that might not be as digestible for the cat. Um, and also watch out for blood serum products. Um, they don't offer the same level of IgG. So why is colostral fat so important? That's my little guy. <laughs> my calves at home. And that He's already about nine months old here, so he's already changed quite a bit. <laughs> so, um, talking about colostrum, um, the proprieties of gross energy in colostrum are made up of protein, fat, and lactose. So, 58% from protein, 36% from fat, and 6% from lactose. But when a calf is born, their gut is immature and they, not, they may not be as efficient as at digesting protein. So taking that factor into consideration, proportions shift. So the calf actually has more as their energy source in the classroom. So making these levels more like 25% protein, 63% fat, and 12% lactose as far as how they're utilizing this for energy. So, um, the other benefit is maternal colostrum offers um, a positive impact on the calf's digestive and metabolism. Um, oh. It helps them with thermoregulation, so the calf is able to maintain and regulate their body temperature better from the colostral fat in the colostrum. Um, so that's a lot more important in the winter, obviously, so they can stay warmer. Um, it also affects hormonal signaling, signaling later in life, um, sex traits specifically, and um, stress responses. Um, they've also seen a lot of benefit with inflammation and immune response, um, as well as brain development, specifically from omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids found in the colostrum, from the colostral fat. Um, we also should keep in mind, like, when, you're, when you guys are milking a cow, she doesn't just make colostrum one day and the next day it's milk, you know, it's 12 and a half percent solids, we'll say. Um, there's a transition period there. So um, you, got, you have to remember that there's 50 plus bioactive factors that are in that colostrum that do serve benefit to those calves. So maybe considering dosing that milk replacer or whole milk with colostrum from vaccinated cows could serve you some benefit um, on the health side. Um, I want to touch a little bit on offering a high plan of nutrition for the calves. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on specific programs um, because I believe that different things work on different farms and I like to be able to work with people and customize those programs to fit you guys and your needs and what your goals are on your farm. So offering a high plan of nutrition does let our calves reach their genetic potential um, and hopefully sooner if we're providing a higher plane of nutrition for those calves. Um, they are the most efficient at converting feed to gain in the first two months of life. If you look down here at this chart right here, it will show you. So they're about 78% efficient at converting from zero to two months. That drops down to about 38% between two to six months old, and it just keeps declining as they get older. So, um, 
it makes more sense to try to put more nutrition into those cats because they are utilizing it more. Um, the other thing to that is it does impact mammary development. So the more nutrients we provide our calves, the better mammary development we have. I don't know if you are aware that um, we can influence mammary development by nutrition pre-puberty. So before those animals reach puberty, um, providing them with more nutrients actually helps develop the parenchyma, which is in their mammary system, and that ends up being what produces your milk later in life in their udders. Um, so the other thing is improving first lactation milk yield. We can influence that with increasing our average daily gain. And increasing average daily gain can be impacted by improving the plan of nutrition we're providing those calves. So in this top chart right here, I know you guys probably cannot read that, um, but Purina specifically has done a lot of research um, that for every tenth of a pound increase in average daily gain, so say your calves are at a one and a half pound average daily gain right now, if we can bump them up to 1.8 pounds of average daily gain in the first two months of life, we're going to see a lot more milk. So for every tenth of a pound, we see 155 pounds of milk in the first lactation. Okay, so if, if we take it even further than to weaning, if we take that through to breeding age, if we can increase our average daily gain by a tenth of a pound from birth till, till breeding age, we'll see 328 pounds more in the first lactation. So it takes us a while till we get any return on these animals, right? And they're your future. So why not feed them better so they're making you more money in two years? So where are your calves performing? So if you don't measure them, you can't manage them, right? So that's something I want to touch on, and that's also something we can provide you guys help with, is benchmarking your calves and looking at what your current program is doing for you. And is there room for opportunity to grow and improve? Um, learning what your cost per pound of gain is is really important. Um, shows you the value of your program you're using as, as opposed to just looking at the cost per, pound, per bag. Um, and it shows how, how your animals are utilizing that product. Um, gives you decision-making leverage to choose what feed program fits best for your operation. So please let me know if any of you are interested in something like that. Vaccinations. Um, I'm not going to talk about those much because you're going to hear about that later. Um, but I also encourage you to work alongside with your veterinarians to figure out um, what protocols work best for your operation. Water quality is the last thing I'm going to focus on. I think it's uh, something that gets overlooked a lot on farms and can be an underlying issue. Um, so why should you test your water? Specific minerals and bacteria content can impact the health of your calves. Um, it can reduce the palatability of the water. Um, so if our water doesn't taste good, you're probably not going to want to drink it very well, right? Which leads to dehydration and less starter intake. And if we're not getting starter intake, we're not developing their rumen and can lead to other issues, um, transitioning after weaning, those kinds of things. So um, we can also see increase in scours. Um, sodium specifically is an issue with scours. Um, cleanliness of your equipment. Your equipment might not even be getting very clean because your um, total dissolvable solids or your hardness of your water can be really high. Um, and that can cause issue. Biofilms can build up. Um, and I know it seems pretty common for people to have a water softener 
in, on their farm because typically a lot of farms don't have great water or we're using wells and things. Um, but sometimes putting a water softener in can cause a lot of issues because um, you are putting sodium in and that can cause sodium toxicity in calves. Um, so I would encourage you to have your water tested. Um, they really say you should have that done annually. But do, does anyone get their water tested annually? <coughs> yeah. So um, it, I definitely think it's something that's overlooked. Um, but that is something we can help with. Um, I run calf-specific water tests. Calves have different tolerance levels for minerals than adult cows do. Um, so we can definitely help look into those kinds of things for you. Um, a calf is 70% water when they're born, so it's kind of a big deal that they have it. Um, I think it's more common that calves probably don't get as much water during the winter either. Um, I know feeding calves and dumping out ice all the time is a pain in the butt, right? Slows everyone down. Um, but it's really important. Um, I would encourage you to offer warm water to calves as well. That seems to help with your intakes on water. They'll drink it better. Um, then they'll eat more starter for you. And uh, should help their immune system and everything else function better. So um, always offer fresh, clean water to the calves, even if it's cold and freezing. Um, this would be, this, this is a picture of a calf-specific water test that I ran for someone. Um, and it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Um, comes back and if you're in the red, that's bad. Green's good and yellow's caution. So um, this is just the first page. There's some more things we look at. Um, manganese isn't showing on here. And I think this specific farm had a really high manganese issue. Um, manganese affects palatability of water. Um, this farm specifically had a new well dug and it was extremely high in manganese and he actually saw his rolling herd average drop by 3,000 pounds because cows weren't drinking water. So water is really important. Um, so that's what, that's all I wanted to say was just those few things. Um, do you guys have any questions at all on any of that? You can always ask me later or reach out to me and I'd be happy to help you. All right, looks like they're bringing out your food. Oh. Drinks. Drinks? Yeah. Okay, they're bringing out your drinks. <laughs> so food should probably be uh, shortly after that, I assume. Okay. today. <laughs> <laughs> As you're finishing your desserts, we're going to go ahead and start with presentations, but um, continue finishing your meal there. And, um, so um, I have with me Dr. Raphael Lichty. He is our commercial research and technical service veterinarian. He grew up in Germany. He has practiced in New York and in Idaho, as well as he has worked for Beringer Engelheim and Norbrook. But he's been with us here at MUSL for um, not quite a year yet. But um, he combines scientific knowledge with real world practical solutions. And he's working on some research trials and provides technical support for um, the cell team. So that's why I have him here today. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Raphael. Thank you so much. Cool. So thank you guys for having me here. Um, so I came out here from California, so I'm a little bit insane probably because our weather's a little nicer than what you guys have to offer our over here. But it's actually not my first time in Ohio. Last time I was here was about 22 years ago or so. Anybody heard of the Mennonite Central Committee before? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So I used to come and run the meat canning truck because to Kidman and Berlin and so I got all kinds of fun stories there. Uh, getting a 20 year old kid from Germany uh, to uh, help run that truck. Anybody helped in that truck before? 
Okay, all right, so this is not a complete stranger. Um, and uh, really what I'm looking for this time around in Ohio is a win, because I, I embarrassed myself many times in Ohio before. A uh, couple of quick stories. Kid in Ohio, we were put up uh, right next to that canning facility. A uh, very nice lady, older lady that uh, hosted us. And I don't know how I came up, but in the introductions and hanging out that evening, after she had cooked us a very nice meal, for some reason the question came up. She asked me how old how old I thought she was. I, I'm 20. I know nothing about that stuff. So uh, I was like, well, I don't know, like 80, 85. Like, um, she was 63. So I was uh, kind of a rough start. Um, and my favorite story in Berlin, Ohio, was there was a guy named Levi Schwarzentruber that uh, greeted us when we showed up with a semi-truck to set things up. And uh, he was this really little guy, and I was not little. And uh, so uh, he was monkeying around, and he was kind of a funny dude. He's actually a contractor. And uh, for some reason, I decided to pick him up and <laughs> turn him upside down. So, uh, and then he was like, hold on a second, I gotta steal the steel hip, you can't do this to me, right? So then we do these presentations at church, you know, before this whole thing happens. And uh, of course he told everybody that picked them upside down and held them by his legs like a chicken, but I didn't quite do that. So, <laughs> so anyway, so if I embarrass myself, that's kind of part of uh, the game plan in life. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for having us here. Uh, and uh, for Sentara to put this together. Um, if you guys have any questions uh, as I go down my presentation path, you're always welcome to derail me, ask me questions, uh, maybe also challenge the things that I say. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to have that interaction. So we're going to talk about uh, setting caps up for success. Uh, and Geneva did a very nice job already on some of the very important things that you got to get right when it comes to cost management and those types of things. Um, and so, well, so we're going to talk about setting caps up for success, and I decided we're going to talk about Olga. Okay, Olga is a buffalo in Yellowstone, and we're going to figure out what can we learn from her and how she sets her caps up for success. Okay, before we do that, though, uh, in your cell, so the makers of First Defense, I uh, just want to do a quick introduction. This is our team. Uh, I love having these outliers always in there. It's like somebody's always got to screw up, right? So nobody's wearing sunglasses except for Jill. Uh, so we're, we're uh, a fun, small company. Uh, we're actually publicly traded, uh, but there's only about 60, 70 employees all in, uh, and about 10 of them are in the sales and marketing uh, side, and that's who you see here, except for the CEO uh, right there. He lost all his hair because it's just not that easy to run a publicly traded company. Uh, we're producing everything in Portland, Maine. Uh, sales team, we're in every dairy shed. And then uh, we really have a team of calf experts. And just uh, same thing for uh, Greg and sales reps that you encounter. A lot of these people are actually incredibly knowledgeable about what they are uh, about uh, dairying and calves and those types of things. So, so give them credit. They can really help you out. Um, and then <coughs> saving calves, living the dream is kind of what we do. And uh, back in vet school, um, in fourth year, you basically run around 12, 14 hours in the hospital, and you're running papers and dogs and cats for clinicians and residents back and forth. And so we would always pass each other in the hallway, uh, and because we're still in good spirits, we'd be like, what are you doing today, Raphael? And we're like, saving lives, living the dream, right? So making photocopies for the clinician. So we're actually saving calves and we're living the dream. So this is us in our natural habitat. We all like to be uh, outside, outdoors, except for Becky. So I don't know why she's, why she's not outside in her picture, but anyways. Cool, so uh, outline, raising calves is, is simple in theory, but it ends up not being that straightforward. If anybody that's raised calves before has had some issues, uh, I'm sure. We're going to talk about what we can learn from Olga, some key concepts to focus on in maternity. Some, we'll talk a little bit about prevention option, option for scours. And then uh, there's also, if you have time at the end, a calf operation assessment tool that we can work through. Uh, that's something you can take with you and do at home. Uh, okay, so any questions up front? 
No? All right. Uh, so success and failure all depends on the setup, which is true for anything in life. In veterinary medicine, when you first start getting, uh, getting out of school and you do your first surgery and you don't have all your tools <laughs> with you because you didn't know what to get, and you cut an animal open, you really know that that's very true. You gotta have a good setup to do a good job, right? And so uh, that's really true for anything. And so what does Olga do to set up her calf for success? Well, she calves usually end of May or June. It's nice and warm. Uh, there is, it's usually dry. Most of the rain's gone in Yellowstone by then. Uh, and um, there's not a lot of folks around there, right? So there's, there's just not a lot of uh, uh, mud or uh, dirty areas around there. So calving environment is clean. Most likely the same the spot that she drops this calf. Uh, at least for a year, there hasn't been a, a calf born in that area, and maybe even like ever, because there's 5,000 of these in Yellowstone, and it's like a quarter of the size of Ohio. So the population density is pretty low. Uh, and with that, it means that calf gets into an area that uh, probably has a very low pathogen load, because we haven't had a lot of animals on that in the past. Feed availability is great. So mom's got lots of grass to eat. I know that picture doesn't show that very well, but I couldn't find a better one. Um, and, um, and so she probably has really good uh, colostrum, lots of milk uh, for the calf to survive in. So, uh, and then lastly, air quality is gonna be super awesome unless they have wildfires, but they usually start later in the season, right? So, so she, she checks the box on a lot of things that are really important in general uh, to, uh, to set these calves up for. So then, if we look at those same areas in modern dairies, what do we do, right? So time of year, we're going to go year-round. So hot, cold, we also have nice conditions, but we do have to deal with the elements, especially coming here in this beautiful weather. Uh, you guys are dealing with that and have been dealing with that for some time. Calving environment. We're usually calving these, uh, these animals out in the same area. So we have a much higher concentration of animals going through kind of a very narrow system. Uh, and that means we have to be really, really good about cleanliness. Uh, but when things don't work out, we have a lot of variability on the cleanliness. So we can end up getting a lot of uh, exposure to, to things early on in life. And so our pathogen load can actually skyrocket even time of day if you have way more calves that day than usual. You know, your systems can break down fairly easily at times, and your bedding's not quite as good. You didn't get to the calf on time. So there's, uh, when everything's perfect, your pathogen load is probably fairly good, but you can certainly have some times where that doesn't happen. Feed availability, of course, is great. Uh, there's some weird diets out there that restrict dry cows, but for the most part, uh, that's, that's also very good. And then air quality, is really variable on your setup, but also in time of year again. You know, if it's really hot, uh, what does the ventilation look like when it's really cold? Again, what does the ventilation look like? Do you close things up and not have very good uh, fresh air and start getting some ammonia uh, uh, development? So those are, that, that's kind of uh, the things that we have to battle, right? So we are setting these calves up to, and this is extreme, extreme examples, and none of these are in Ohio, by the way, so you guys can completely say we're better than this. But it's, um, you know, if, if you put 50 calves in a fairly small spot for the first 12 hours, they're probably gonna get stuff from other calves, right? They're also gonna get stuff from the equipment that you use to tube feed these calves, because you can pass stuff from one calf to another if you're not very clean and, and sanitized in between. Um, and, uh, and so they, they end up getting potentially really high levels of E. coli, rota, corona, all those things that uh, make our calves sick early on in life. Uh, when it comes to colostrum quality and also cleanliness, that can be variable. Uh, so you have to have a good protocol in place uh, to make, make sure that the colostrum is clean uh, and you have uh, the right quality, like was, what was shown earlier. Uh, and then you do have variable uh, levels of heat and cold stress. And those are, some of those we can address, some, some of them we, we find limitations within that. Uh, and then the air quality, 
Uh, again, if you look at, at this example, in the summer when it's 100 degrees, this was a place in Idaho, uh, there's probably going to be some issues with air quality as well, right? Um, cool. So we basically made a trade, right? So we didn't have to worry about these types of predators, right? But we have all of these bugs now uh, that we're very good at growing just by default. Um, and so we do have to provide them with additional protection because we're also exposing them to way more than what they would see in nature uh, when it comes to pathogens. Any questions so far? No? All right, cool. So, um, yeah, so what do we focus on? And sorry, that was supposed to be bigger and whatever. I'll just have to read it. Um, so we have to control vari variables for these calves, right? So uh, pristine bedding for every single calf. There cannot be a break in that, otherwise you will get pro you will have problems. Uh, back to uh, colostrum quality, I bring that up several times because it is that important. And when I go in on a consulting gig and there's uh, a lot of calf issues, most of the time, and I'm sure Jen can probably attest to that, if you just look at how colostrum is handled, how it is harvested, how it is uh, stored, what kind, if you have a pasteurized or if you, if you feed it fresh, there's usually a problem in that step and you end up feeding high levels of bacteria. That's why we keep bringing this up uh, because most of the time, uh, if you come in and work up a problem, that's where we find the solution a lot of times, or at least the causative agent. Um, air quality, I know there's been a lot around that uh, for cows and for calves, uh, makes a big difference if you bring them good air. Uh, you know, if you're not within 50 to 80 degrees for those calves, that's, they, don't, they don't do well. So you have to provide additional cooling if you're over 80 degrees, which happens in Ohio, I'm sure. Um, and, uh, and it definitely happens to be under 50 degrees, so calf blankets, um, but then also uh, heating them up quickly after birth. Uh, and then, of course, you do have to look at additional pre prevention, so vaccinations, uh, antibodies um, uh, to boost their immunity. Because we're just, we're just giving them way more to deal with than what they would do naturally. Okay? So... Next up is scours. Any questions so far? Anybody want to challenge what I said? No? Perfect. So scours happens, but it's preventable. Uh, who here has dealt with calf scours before? <laughs> yeah? Is it easy to get rid of? Yes, it's easy? Yeah? How, how do you get rid of it? Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. That's always the right answer. It depends, yeah. No, but you're right. I mean, it, there's, uh, but it usually comes back down to process and cleanliness, is most of the time. It also helps to only have like one or two at a time. That yeah, helps a lot. 60 at a time. Yep, absolutely. Yep. For sure. So, um, one of the things about scours is, is when we see that, that is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of things that happen to that calf after they've had a scouring event. And they're much more likely to, to develop other diseases. This is a very busy graph. Um, here's all the references. If you want me to send them to you, you're welcome to look at those. Um, but it basically just shows, so with scours, we have the short-term effects and then the long-term effects. Uh, and it ties into a little bit of what Geneva was talking earlier. But of course, short-term, if you get it, you have the treatment, you have the cost, all that stuff. Um, so those are all direct uh, costs with that. Immortality uh, definitely happens short term uh, with, with, with those, but then the bigger thing is actually what happens after that. Uh, so if they have scours, they will make less milk when they come fresh, right? Uh, all those things that happen the first couple of weeks of life are a big deal. So the breeding usually can be affected, but they're more likely to be cold. And the thing that's probably the most um, uh, profound is that there's 17, 0.7 times more likely to develop pneumonia down the road. So Jane's going to talk about uh, how to prevent that <laughs> later on uh, in the talk. But yeah, it's a big deal. So if we can prevent them and uh, scours and really get them started off right, uh, it is, it's going to help us long term. 
It also means whatever we put in in that first day or two or first couple weeks of life for those calves, you will see a return for that. Um, but it's usually, you, the impacts are usually felt later. So as far as prevention options, um, I'll talk about dam level vaccines, so vaccines that you give to the cows. Uh, calf level vaccines are available, and then calf level or, uh, oral bodies, uh, oral antibodies. Uh, and of course, I'm gonna try to sell you on that idea because that's what we make. So uh, just get ready for that. Um, but yeah, so dam level vaccines, uh, the idea behind those is you vaccinate dry cows, depending on which vaccine you use, there's different uh, schedules, but you have to be really stringent and stay within the timelines that they uh, say to use them. Uh, and then we just increase the amount of antibodies that are basically circulating in that cow by the uh, while she's making colostrum. And so therefore, in turn, uh, those antibodies end up in the colostrum. You feed that to the calves and uh, they have a higher level of protection, right? So that's, uh, that's the whole idea behind that. Um, and uh, one of the challenges with it is that you definitely get a variability in immune response, and there's a lot of things that go into making quality colostrum. So there's, uh, it's, it's not always a one-to-one -one relationship that, hey, I gave her this, and then we got protection. Uh, there's actually a, a paper, out, it's fairly dated now, but where they looked at uh, what was the actual antibody response, uh, you know, control versus uh, cows that got treated and, uh, and on real dairies. Uh, and it was actually very difficult to show a response um, because of all those different variables that you can't always control. Uh, it is a good idea, however, um, to do that just because we're not 100% effective. It's probably still a good thing to do. Um, calf level vaccine, so the idea is to vaccinate these calves at birth to provide immunity. Uh, similar problems here is vaccine response. Uh, and then also uh, the disease challenge may come before immunity happens uh, from, from vaccinating early on in life. Uh, some of those vaccines probably have more merit than others. Uh, and if you got questions about that uh, in general, I'm happy to, to answer those. Um, but yeah, so that, the, the other problem that you run into is that you can have uh, the colostral antibodies can really interfere with how well that vaccine works as well early on in life. And so that, uh, that's another thing that they have to overcome. And so effectiveness is not always there. Okay, this is a nice quote here about, um, uh, and I think with the last couple of years and COVID and everything, we've all gotten a fairly healthy dose of, hey, we get vaccinated, doesn't necessarily mean we're 100% protected. Um, in, in best case scenario, 80% is kind of a thing that people throw out that uh, it works depending on the vaccine and the immune status of the animal or the person. Uh, and so uh, we, don't, we don't get 100% protection. So even if, if we just have 20% not protected, that's a pretty significant amount, especially if you think about those animals are likely shedding a lot of those uh, viruses and bacteria all around them. So they can really uh, put a big pathogen load on your whole outfit uh, very quickly. One calf uh, can really throw things off, especially if your sanitation uh, isn't completely up to snuff. And so then what you end up doing is, yeah, you have antibodies, uh, in your calves through colostrum, um, but you just have way more pathogens that they can deal with because they will use those antibodies up, right, over time. Okay, any questions there? No, perfect. Okay, disclaimer, I really like these uh, colostral antibodies in general, that's the whole product, so um, I'm, I'm totally biased, but anyways, I'll, t I'll tell you why I'm biased. Uh, so the idea with the calf level oral antibodies is that you provide targeted uh, immunity very directed towards certain antigens, right? So E. coli, rota, corona, um, and they get absorbed just like uh, colostrum gets absorbed. So you get quite a bit of that IgG that we give them gets absorbed into the bloodstream so it can be around uh, for a while to, to provide protection. And because it is a uh, I mean, it's, it's actually uh, 
you know, it's colostral bovine uh, sourced antibody. Uh, the body does see it as it's as a normal thing, so it gets absorbed, and that's why it works so well. And in one of our biggest challenges is to keep up with demand uh, as a company, because it does work very well. There's also some companies that exited that, uh, uh, I guess, with their products. So we, we inherited some customers from products that came off uh, market in the last few years. And uh, so for us, the biggest uh, problem is that we just can't make enough of it. Um, and so we keep being on allocation or so poor Becky has to deal with that all the time, but uh, EI is not that I'm familiar with that either. <laughs> so since we can, we can pick on that. So basically, uh, cholesterol um, uh, antibodies are awesome in every way. They get absorbed, they do well, uh, they protect, uh, and, and they're very targeted. So um, I've done quite a bit of research on why that is. Why, why are these IgG different that come from bovine uh, colostrum versus even uh, serum, colostrum, uh, serum IgG that you find in the blood? And it's, it's actually, true grit is kind of my abbreviation for it, but they're able to go through this low stomach pH. Uh, they're actually pepsin. Pepsin is, the, um, is uh, what's the enzyme that's used to break down uh, proteins in the stomach. The pepsin resistant, so they can make it through low pH, and they can get uh, past the pepsin. And then in the small intestine, there's an uh, enzyme called trypsin, and it breaks down uh, uh, the proteins as well, and IgG is really just a protein. Uh, but again, the cholesterol uh, antibody, they actually have a uh, trypsin inhibitor uh, that comes with it. And so uh, they can actually be they, they don't only survive the stomach and small intestine, they actually stay active in that as well. And so that's why, that's why these things work so well. That's why colostrum is so important, because uh, it does get absorbed, but there's also certainly a role that it plays in the, in the gut itself. Um, and you mentioned transition milk, right? Transition milk has a lot of IgG in it as well. If you can feed that longer, for example, you will keep providing them with more IgG. Maybe they can't absorb it all, but it does fight, uh, fight things off locally as well. Um, so uh, in first defense, we're very specific. So we actually make sure that you have the right antibody levels for E. coli, K99, Corona, and rotavirus, um, uh, so that, that it is a protective amount of an, uh, antibody. Now, with antibodies in general, if you have a lot of challenge, they do get used up, right? We only give a finite amount. Uh, once they're used up, they're gone. Uh, but uh, uh, the half-life of them, if you didn't have a big challenge, uh, is 21 days. And so, uh, you know, on day one, I mean, half-life just means that after 21 days, half of what they start out with is still there. And then a quarter, quarter uh, 21 days after that, so you do get more uh, duration of immunity in just a few days uh, when you use first defense. Um, any questions on that so far? Cool. cool. So here's, uh, here's our product lineup. So we're a very small company. We also don't have a huge portfolio of different products. We, right now, we pretty much just have the first defense uh, lineup. And our original product was this blue pill. Um, first defense bolus, uh, and it has the uh, coronavirus and the K99 and E. coli antibodies in those. Uh, the next product that we developed was to put that in a paste form so you don't have to give the pill. Um, and uh, so it's a little bit easier administration. Uh, it also has a, oops, it also has a blue dye in it that is, actually has become a protocol tracker because you can tell by the color of the manure if the calf actually got the product or not. Uh, and then TriShield has only been out for about three years. There's a paper in the Journal of Dairy Science that was published in September about the approval work and also uh, another uh, group where they did a very strong rotavirus challenge to look at how protective is that. Uh, that's what we used to uh, get our uh, approval for the USDA. So all these products are USDA labeled. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and you, you, you give it 
ideally right after first administration of colostrum, uh, and then it just really adds those uh, antibodies and they get absorbed just like they were part of the colostrum. Or you can use powder if you run out of the gel, right? That's the way it earlier. Um, just real quick, uh, so it makes sense how we make this stuff. We actually, we have a, a couple different sets of herds and um, uh, we actually use a commercial uh, scour vaccine at dry off and then we have our proprietary vaccine that we come in three times during the dry period uh, to really boost those antibody levels. And then we collect the uh, colostrum from those cows that gets shipped to our facility where it basically gets freeze dried, uh, purified um, and concentrated. Then we have to send that out to a third party and they will actually check how potent of antibodies or what the potency is of the powder. So how many uh, antibodies per gram basically. Uh, and then we bring it back to our facility and uh, for, the, uh, for the first defense bolus or a dual force, uh, we just use the, uh, the antibodies that come out of this herd. Uh, for TriShield, we actually blend, we make a blend between the uh, rotavirus uh, uh, herd and, and the other one. And so interestingly enough is that if you were to open up one of those pills, uh, depending on which batch you got, the fill volume will be different. And that's just because we just make sure that you get the right amount of antibodies, but the potency of each batch is different because we're dealing with biology and so it's not always responding the same way. So uh, the reason why that is not a clear bolus is because you'd be like, hey, the thing's not full, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I want my money back, whatever, it didn't work. But it's, um, but it's actually, you always get a very metered out amount of antibodies, so it's always the same. Uh, and that is also true, of course, then for the paste. Um, and uh, yeah, we have, we have our own uh, vaccine that we make. It's virus-like particle uh, for the Rota uh, vaccine because we could not find a commercially available vaccine that would stimulate enough antibody response. So we went out and made our own. Um, and then uh, standardized potency, and, and it's all USDA uh, approved. Okay, here we go. So our protocol tracker. I have a question. Yes. So can you back a couple slides to the half life thing? Yes. <clears throat> so if you have a calf, theoretically, that um, that you've given tri shield to, mm -hmm. and still that animal still scours day three, let's say. So in theory, she should be covered by ro for Rhoda in mm -hmm. July and Crozars. So would, I mean, I've, it's probably a cleanliness issue, but would you say it's, it's likely that it's a different organism or is it likely that she didn't, that she's not protected enough and it still could be one of those three? Or how would you tackle so it's in the first three days of life? Um, five, five? Three to five, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the first thing I would check is make sure that you actually do have passive immunity. So the, ser the serum, serum proteins are normal, right? To make sure you actually give them enough colostrum. Because you don't want to just give tri-shield, right? You obviously want to do the regular oh, you colostrum. Mean you give colostrum too? Yeah, yeah, she winked at me. <laughs> Anyways, so um, but uh, so most of the time that ends up being a cleanliness thing where you just it may be just a lot of different bacteria that you're throwing at them because something wasn't quite clean. Yeah. That's most of the time what it is. Yeah. Uh, you could in theory also have uh, just so much if it's E. coli or K99 they they're just overwhelmed. They're they're used up. So you can always. Uh, if the exposure is really, really great, you can always go along any of those things. So, right any other questions? So that half, that half life, that day one, one hundred percent doesn't necessarily translate to she's one hundred percent protected. No, it so just means one hundred percent effective effic efficacy of this product is what you're talking about. So what what that really means is just how long can they be around for? So okay. if I don't have a big challenge, right? 
then uh, in theory you should still at 21 days you should still have nice protection with this product because if I absorb uh, whatever I absorb on day one would be a hundred percent of what you absorb right and then off of, off that you only get about half of that uh, 21 days later right but it is always a uh, there's but early on in life it's usually there's a problem in maternity if it's that early uh, and once you find that whether it's the equipment not being clean or the way the a lot of times it's the way the gloss was being harvested or there's there's a lot of little things you gotta get right right um, and that's usually where so it, it may just be that you had a bunch of other bacteria that you showered together with right so does that answer your question all right cool um, protocol tracker, I think this is the coolest thing ever. I just did a trial with 400 calves in Idaho, and uh, half of them got our product, the other half didn't. And it, it was like, as I, uh, we'll see how many of them will change colors, right, on manure. But it was literally like 100% of them came through with emerald green manure. So my question is, is it emerald production, or is it actually a <laughs> protocol tracker? Because it friggin' matched so well. <laughs> and that entire barn was uh, at, at green spots all over it. But that's actually a really big deal, right? So if you have, uh, for the next two, three days of life, uh, you will see that odd colored manure or stool. So you can actually be like, oh, we haven't been giving it. Like there's, there's not a lot of products out there that you can actually say, Yep, got it, right, versus, no, I didn't get it. Because you don't, or do you have a vaccine now that you can track that it got given? <laughs> so, so anyways, by the way, that happened by mistake, that protocol tracker, but we'll take it. It's the, um, the bolus was always blue, right? So they just wanted to stay with a blue gel, and it ended up, I mean, it's a non-digestible dye that's in it. And so then we're like, oh, look, you can tell that they got it. So now it's our protocol tracker. But anyways, life sometimes, uh, uh, I guess, uh, brings you some positive surprises. So, I mean, in summary, you got to control the environment to cut down pathogen load. And that is different for every outfit, what that looks like. Um, and then you got to give these calves extra protection to navigate all the variables that will happen because life does happen, right? Uh, and, and this is, again, you guys can pick in California, isn't that great? This is a California dry lot. Uh, and, you know, how often does this happen? Oh, I just got born, everything's clean, I'm gonna get up and I'll just take a nosedive and whatever's in front of me, right? So it's super easy to get contamination and no, none of us are really immune to getting that to our calves because at times that's gonna happen. Okay, any questions on that? So uh, I'll just run through some pictures that you guys will enjoy, they're good and bad examples of things. Um, but one of the things that I think is super important is uh, any of the stuff that we talked to you about is completely worthless unless there's a way to implement it, right? And so one of the things that I have found that can actually work is that you, uh, you do come up with specific checklists that periodically somebody has to go through and do a self-assessment uh, of all the practices that you're doing. Um, and so I, I always say with employees, and you're an employee? No, <laughs> sorry, I was picking the people that I met because I only met three of you guys. Um, so uh, trust but verify, right? Because things do go awry and you do have more calves and the tractor broke down and you had all this other stuff happening. So are we still doing all the things that we do? So whether it's a weekly or monthly or some, some of the big places I haven't set up on daily checklists uh, just to make sure these things get done. And checklists, of course, like anything else, only work if you actually use them. Um, but it, you know, it, it, this is just an example of one. And if I mean, I could send it to you if you're interested. But this is really just um, more an example. When you have a calf problem, I always start on a dry, dry cow pen. What does it look like? How clean is it? Do they have nice stalls? Is there uh, a high, uh, you know? Uh, is there a high challenge there just for maybe getting infections during the dry period? Because that will definitely affect colostrum quality. Um, you know, are they are they fat? Are they thin? Are they just right? Those types of things. We definitely don't want to see stuff like this, right? And uh, I, I bet everybody has seen that before. But we should we should really strive to have more something like that, right? Where it's nice, uh, clean, dry, 
and then uh, you don't have overcrowding, right? Um, if you have a fairly, you know, if you have a full freestyle, at least the bed should be clean. You should be going through and groom those just as often as you do a milk house. Um, and uh, here's my favorite example because, hey, everything's perfect, right? But underneath, it's all mud. So it's just a bed at that day, but it's been actually pretty dirty for a long time. So it's, uh, you do have to stay on this uh, all the time. Maternity, there's lots of variables. I like to show this one because it's a nice way to, um, to actually have the calf in a controlled environment that you can clean up fairly easily. So you, put, you actually have them born into these tubs and then cows still can get to her, but it's a nice controlled environment, even if maybe the surroundings aren't so great. Um, but yeah, you, you gotta have things, um, let's see, well, there. This isn't a perfect maternity by any stretch of the imagination, but I know the calf chains aren't hanging here, right? I mean, there's a, you gotta have things really clean, organized. Uh, you gotta have, one of the big things I think that we've started doing a lot more, and you're getting a lot more help from lots of companies, is uh, post the protocols. So when I start working for you, I should be able to find the protocols fairly easily to see what I should be doing, um, and not just assume that you know how to do that. Uh, Every, I mean, simple things, and I see these done incorrectly a lot. It's just, do you have enough soap? Do you have sleeves? Do you have all these uh, basic things readily available? Um, and, uh, and then also the, uh, the other big one is when the temperature falls below 50 degrees, do you have a way to heat these calves up quickly? Because hypothermia, hypoglycemia, those are so not enough sugar, too cold. They're great calf killers, works every time. Right? So if you can prevent those uh, by giving good nutrition, make sure that they, they stay warm, uh, that's a really big deal. Colostrum, I don't have to go through that because that's already been covered, but I mean, these are all real pictures, right? This is all stuff that happened. Um, so yeah, no, they didn't clean this yesterday, right? This is where all the milk that all the calves get that, get every day fed out of, that's the tank, right? I don't know why I got scours. Everything's perfect, right? Well. Um, yeah, it's not always perfect. Uh, this is not a very well controlled way to keep your colostrum, right? No lid, the different container sizes, uh, they're hard to clean, uh, they probably don't get cleaned, otherwise they wouldn't have so many rings on them, right? Uh, in calf bottles, they have to be able to be sanitized really well. So th you know, it doesn't show in the picture, but these are old and they have cracked plastic, so therefore lots of bacteria live in there all the time. Uh, and if you see that handle right there and the handle right there, these are the clean bottles. So, you know, you just couldn't get, get the colostrum remnants out of the handle. But that means as soon as you put any kind of liquid in there, the bacteria are like, time to go for a swim, right? And we're going to repopulate that in seconds, literally. So it's, um, you know, you, the more you can set up systems, the better. And this is the other extreme. Um, and, uh, you know, so you have everything organized, you have a protocol, uh, obviously this one helps you with, uh, in, in, you know, making sure the protocol gets done right. But you still gotta check this machine too, right? Because the machine will also malfunction. And have a nice way to reheat them. You know, this is definitely, you know, how, how clean is this water bath? I don't know, I didn't take a culture of that. Uh, but that's, that's something needs to be cleaned out in between each batch, right? So some of those things, if you skimp on them, uh, now all of a sudden you just have bacteria covering that entire bottle. It's pretty easy to contaminate things. Um, moving calves to hutches, that's another one where use a equipment that you can clean to, to move them with. You know, don't have extra animals in there. And I, I don't have the picture of the bad example because I felt bad showing it actually, but it's like the trailer with like 10 calves in it and they're all on top of each other. Obviously we don't do that, but it's also fairly easy to not clean that thing, right? And, and so just really staying up on top of those. Um, we don't ever want to see this, right? Where's that calf, calf going to lie down in? That's a real picture. That happened, right? Uh, and that does happen when it rains. But we need to try to, to uh, make sure that they do get bedding. Here's the other extreme, right? It's like a friggin' clinic. Uh, you know, where you have all these stalls and you got, you know, positive tube ventilation, all that stuff. And it's great, right? You can completely uh, clean these things up, sanitize them in between calves. 
That doesn't mean that a barn's going to feed, you know, raise better calves than if you just have a hutch. Uh, that, one, that one can get just as dirty, it's just easier to clean in between, right? Um, so there's lots of different examples of things that work, but it just, it ends up coming down to, you know, cleanliness, bedding, good air, uh, uh, temperature regulation. Uh, otherwise, you really will have a lot of things that you're fighting and you never know exactly what you're fighting. Um, you know, these are good examples of uh, cleaning, uh, cleaning equipment and also letting them air dry and being set up really well, having protocols to track those types of things. Um, sorry, I just skipped forward, but uh, you know, they, they have protocols on we washed at this point in time and this is who did it, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a nice way to track what really happens. Treatment protocols and treatment records. Uh, you should, I should be able to walk on your farm and easily figure out all your treatment protocols. Should be in a book or should be posted somewhere because when somebody new comes on and they don't know what to do, there's got to be a quick reference. They will not always call you if they don't know what to do, right? Um, and then uh, treatment records, of course, need to be readily available and ideally use herd management software, which I heard on an earlier conversation that not everybody uses herd management software, which you don't need to, but whatever records you do, they have to stay, uh, stay really current and be readily accessible, right? Um, and then calf hutches, there's so many different ways to doing it right. Um, it's just, uh, what, what I always do is when you go through, you really just observe them, right? And there shouldn't be a whole lot of noise going on unless it's right before feeding. You shouldn't hear coughs. You shouldn't hear those types of things. Um, uh, it should smell really great. You shouldn't have an ammonia stench if you're in a barn or outside. Um, and then calves should be, I mean, if you feed them well and they're healthy, they're pretty, pretty happy little critters. So they should act as such, right? Um, and uh, if you have them be afraid of people, that usually tells you that maybe they're not it's not such a positive experience when they are around people. So those are all fairly easy things that you can um, can assess. But but I, I would encourage all of you guys to work with your veterinarian or come up with lists so that you do control those variables more and you have a way to go back to kind of where you want it to be. Because protocol drift's a real thing, especially at my house, right? Kids are supposed to do dishes after dinner. That happens like three days in a row. And then unless I mention it, it's done. And then they forgot that we ever talked about it, right? I mean, so uh, protocol drift does happen, right? All right, that's all I got. Any questions? There's more California pictures. <coughs> um, I've had some producers ask So the question, I'll repeat your question. So the question is, producers have asked about giving tri-shield or first defense at five days old versus at, a day, at, at, at one day old. So obviously, if you give it at five days old, you will not get any absorption into the bloodstream, right, because the gut's closed. Um, will you get activity at the gut level? The answer is most likely yes, right, because they are able to get through the whole, whole uh, digestive tract basically and still be happily alive, right, and, and ready for business. And so um, we're seeing more and more people using it that way, and also like as a treatment. Um, but that's all off-label stuff, I guess. But, um, you're supposed to give it while they can still reabsorb it, so then you get a better duration. Because if you just give it in the gut, I actually have no idea how long it's there. That's one of the things I'm going to look at is because you do, you do get some attachment to the villi, so the projections inside the gut, um, uh, but I don't know how long it sticks around. So. Any other questions? Yes. This is a question. It's more of a. I, I noticed on your on your slide where the bottle was laying over, and on the other ones it was standing up. On our farm, we had them laying over, and we decided we need to get that water out of them. So you got milk cartons, and you get nine bottles in that thing perfectly, and you put them up in the water. Yeah. Right. And you just basically you try and keep them dry. See, that's a perfect way to 
change your process to decrease variables. That's a perfect example of that, yeah. Absolutely. And that's true, like, if stuff is, is wet, by definition, it's probably not, I mean, if it's wet for a long time, by definition, it's probably not clean anymore, right? Because you do, especially in barns, you get lots of manure dust, right? And it's just waiting for somewhere to adhere to. And wet is really a great way for them to land. So, yeah. Yeah, to uh, if you pasteurize it, is it better, do you believe, than unpasteurized phosphorus? So I'll go back to your answer. That depends. <laughs> I mean, it, it really depends on overall. If you, I mean, yes, there are dairies that are very successful with fresh colostrum, right? Uh, if you harvest it properly, you still have some way to test it uh, and then uh, administer it quickly, then yeah, they can really work well, right? Uh, it, as, as you get bigger, it doesn't work that well anymore a lot of times, especially if you have any any sort of storage in between. Hey, yeah, we fed the calf, but we had like, you know, we have another six bottles from this colossal feeding. We'll feed it tomorrow, and we'll put it in the fridge, and then we'll let it sit out for 30 minutes to warm up, and, and then all of a sudden you got a complete wreck. So it really depends on your setup and how you're able to execute on some of those things. So basically freeze it? What's that? So basically freeze it right away. Yeah, cooling it down very quickly for sure. But again, if it's unpasteurized, that time from harvest, whatever's in there, to getting cooled down, you're going to get multiplication, right? So it really starts out with how clean you start out. Right? Any other questions? Okay, I got to tell you about George. And then I'm done. So this is George. So he was run over in Idaho by a cousin of my wife's and uh, didn't hurt him. He's like, he's actually fairly big. He's like a giant tortoise, right? Um, but they went to a wedding, they backed over him on the way out of the parking lot. Uh, and there's George and he's just happily, just whatever. He just ran over me, but I don't care. So that was in Northern Idaho in the summertime, right? This is a, an African spur tortoise. So. I'm scrolling through Facebook, which is a complete time waster. Don't do it. But I'm, I'm going. I'm scrolling through Facebook, and I see Bridget posted herself with this tortoise hanging out with George. Right. So I, I was like, oh, cool. Tortoises are awesome. Always one of them. Good for you. Right. In my little comment, uh, my phone goes off two days later, and Bridget's husband Dane texts me. He's like, so you like tortoises? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> It's like George is looking to relocate to a more temperate climate because Idaho gets cold and these guys don't, don't actually hibernate. So, uh, so this was actually the day before I started working for Immucel. Uh, I went and picked up George. I had to drive eight hours to get him. Uh, and uh, George is pretty much awesome. If you ever want to learn how to live, come into my front yard and watch George. He's got it figured out, right? There's like no rush on him. He actually gets a good workout every day. He eats when he wants, he sleeps when he wants, he goes wherever he wants. So it's, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, so this is George. He's like, and now I have him in the front yard so all the, all the neighbors play with him. So it's a, it's a great deal. But anyway, all right, that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Before I introduce our next speaker, uh, I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Greg Spear. I'm the Senior Territory Manager for BI in the state of Ohio. Uh, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your schedule to come out today and hopefully you'll learn something. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jennifer Roberts. Dr. Roberts grew up on a dairy in southern Michigan. She attended Michigan State University for undergrad and her DVM degree. After school, after uh, vet school, she moved to Wisconsin where she worked in dairy practice and actually owned, I think she's part owner in that practice. She was there several years and then she came back to Michigan State where she was on the faculty and staff and helped educate our future vets. In fall of 2019, she came to Beringer Ingelheim as our professional service vet. So she works with nine of us uh, in our region doing ride-alongs, educational things like today, works on troubleshooting and issues at farms and anything else BI asked her to do. So with that, Dr. Roberts. Thanks, Greg. All right, so at least here in Ohio working with Greg, 
versus some of the other parts of the region out towards the east. He knows there is a difference between Michigan and Michigan State. <laughs> so he's very careful to make sure he says, I went to Michigan State. So um, just so you all know, I am a Spartan, not a Wolverine. <laughs> so we have that in common. We're not, we're not very fond of those Wolverines. <laughs> So I'm really excited to be here with you guys today and thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to come and listen to um, what Dr. Raphael and myself had to share with you. Um, as Greg mentioned, I started with BI in the fall of 2019 and so um, a few months into my work with BI, I got to work from home. Um, so it's really nice to be out here with all of you and um, talking about calves today. So um, Raphael gave us a, a really nice setup to all of those things that need to happen in the early part of life for that calf for her to be successful. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about vaccination strategies for that calf as she gets a little bit older. Um, you'll see the title there is Invest in the Future of Your Herd. And um, you know Geneva mentioned that earlier that these girls are the future of your herd. And so um, Investing some time and money into them now is going to pay dividends in the future. All right, so I'm going to start off talking a little bit about vaccination goals and principles, and then um, we'll talk about vaccination in the face of maternal antibodies. Those wonderful, important antibodies that are coming from the colostrum. Uh, Dr. Raphael mentioned that you can see some interference with maternal antibodies. And we've got some research with some of our vaccines that will show you that that's not always the case. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up with talking about how to go about developing some vaccine protocols. So our goal when we vaccinate these calves is that we give them the vaccine and we're hoping that they develop immunity. But just the act of giving that vaccine doesn't always mean that they're going to have an immune response. Um, but if it all goes according to plan, we'll have immunity, which will then lead to disease resistance, improved performance, and then increased potential revenue and profits uh, because that animal is going to be healthier and more productive. But we do have some limitations when it comes to vaccines. And as we know, no vaccine is 100%. And this first point here uh, bolded because it's really important to remember that immune system function is more than just vaccination. That calf needs to have a good plane of nutrition. Um, there needs to be cleanliness in the environment. You know, it's, it's a very important part of disease control, but it's not the sole factor. Um, they're not gonna be a solution for poor husbandry or management, and very rarely is the solution to any problem, whether that's scours or respiratory disease or mastitis, very rarely is the solution going to be something that comes in a syringe. There's usually a lot of other factors that we need to think about, some management changes that need to be made, um, and you know, in conjunction with a good solid vaccine protocol, that's gonna help these animals be healthy. So there's some animal limitations to consider as well when we think about whether or not that animal is going to respond to vaccination. So if we think of that bell curve phenomenon, you know, basically we've got all these animals and they're going to be evenly distributed across this bell-shaped curve. And so on any given day, you're going to have some calves that are going to be down here on the low end, some calves that are going to be on the high end of their immune response, and a lot of animals that are just going to be here in the middle with that average acceptable immune response. So we have to recognize that this proper immunization of these animals and because of that bell-shaped curve phenomenon, establishing immunity is gonna take some time. And you know, if you're gonna move a calf to a group pen, we don't wanna vaccinate the day she's being moved because that's not going to give her immune system time to respond to that vaccine and then provide protection when she gets exposed to a virus. So ideally, we'd like to try to vaccinate 30 to 60 days prior to expected challenge. Now with our calves that are being weaned around 60 days of age, that may not be possible. We may be able to hit this 30 day before expected challenge mark. And we'll talk about that um, in a few minutes. But 
you know, oftentimes we perceive that a vaccine fails because those calves still get sick. But if we haven't given that vaccine enough time to work, it may not be the vaccine's fault. We may need to adjust the timing of when that vaccine is administered. So this graph here, it might be kind of hard to see for some of you in the back, but this is data from the USDA. Uh, they do a survey every few years and they'll send surveys out to dairy farms and they'll ask about different management practices on the farm. This particular question was asking about the percentage of operations that administer vaccines of different types to their heifers on the farm. So it's the, the most common uh, respiratory viruses are the ones that I've highlighted here. So IBR, BBD, PI3, and BRSV. So those are gonna be the ones that are in our five-way vaccines or our 10-way vaccines. The different colors, the blue bar is the pre-weaned calf, the light gray is the weaned calf, and the, the dark gray is the pregnant heifer. So what you can see here is that for those pre-weaned calves, we've got about a third of them that are being vaccinated for IBR, PI3, and BRSV. We've got a little a bit less as far as BVD. Any guesses as to why there's maybe a little bit less BVD? Anybody use a vaccine that includes IBR, PI3, and BRSV, a three-way vaccine? So a lot of our, our intranasal vaccines are going to contain those three, and then our injectable modified lives are gonna include BVD. So, you know, this here tells me that a lot of those pre-weaned calves are getting some more intranasals than injectables. And I see that a lot when I go on farm visits. There's a lot of intranasals going into um, pre-weaned calves and not so much modified lives because of the concern of interference with maternal antibodies. Um, and so we're gonna talk about, one of, you know, as Raphael talked about the product he has to sell you, I have a product to sell you too. <laughs> so um, we're gonna talk about providing some of this BBD protection for those young calves and still getting a great immune response, even though they've got those maternal antibodies helping to protect them at that time as well. Um, as we talked earlier in uh, Raphael's presentation, you know, sometimes the maternal antibodies aren't always enough. If there's a high level of challenge, those calves um, may not always be 100% protected. And so if we can boost that immunity with the vaccination, then we can pro provide some additional protection. Um, so, Thinking back to the fact that only about 20% of those pre-weaned calves are covered um, for BBD by vaccination, um, this graph here is showing when calves, when their BBD titers, antibody titers, so to look at how much of an immune response an animal has to a vaccine or from colostrum, we look at those antibody titers. It's basically the level of antibodies in the blood, and we have known levels that would be considered protective. What this is showing is the percent of calves at each of those ages, two days, seven days, one month, and then up to eight months, that their BBD antibody levels have dropped below a level that would be considered protective. So at one month of age, these calves here, um, only about 30% of them have, or sorry, 30% of them have dropped below a level that would be considered protective. By two months, almost half of those calves, their antibody levels are below a level that would be considered protective against BBD. So those calves then would be susceptible moving into group housing at 60 days of age um, because they've, their maternal antibody levels have now dropped below what would be considered protective. Another big virus that we worry about is BRSV in our calves. Has anybody ever experienced a BRSV outbreak? Got a hand up here. Um, it can move through a group of calves really quickly. Um, and so this is uh, from a paper that reviewed some different causes of pneumonia in young calves. And a statement from this paper was that the most commonly identified causes of viral pneumonia in calves during the first few months of life are um, bovine herpes virus, which would be IBR, 
um, and bovine respiratory syncytial virus, or BRSB. So those two viruses are gonna be um, really big players in respiratory disease along with BPD in our young calves. So now we get to the big question. Can we vaccinate these calves with a modified live vaccine before weaning? So with our pyramid line of vaccines, we've done some studies in calves that were about four to five weeks of age at the time of vaccination. So these are calves at an age that historically we would have thought, eh, maybe, maybe we wanna avoid vaccinating them because they've got maternal antibodies there and those maternal antibodies are going to interfere with the vaccine. So this was published in 2020, um, and they were looking at protection of calves vaccinated at four to five weeks of age against that BRSV virus that causes pneumonia. The way this study was set up, they had almost 50 calves enrolled in the study, and they made sure that they had maternal antibodies to BRSV. So after those calves received colostrum, they checked those antibody levels in their blood to make sure that they had received maternal antibodies against BRSV. <coughs> they vaccinated those calves at about 30 days of age, so half of them were vaccinated, the other half were left unvaccinated, and they were about 30 days of age when they did that. Two and a half months after vaccination, they went ahead and challenged these calves. So in a challenge model, they're going to intentionally expose them to that virus and see if they're protected by measuring, you know, did they have clinical signs of disease? And, um, you know, was their protection better than the calves that didn't receive a vaccine at all? They followed those calves for eight days following the challenge, and then they euthanized them to be able to collect tissues and look at um, virus in their lungs. So these pictures are showing you the damage to the lungs after those calves had been challenged with BRSV. So on the left-hand side of the screen, we've got the calves that didn't receive any pyramid vaccine. And the, the light pink here is normal lung tissue. You know, that would be really nice, spongy, um, normal lung tissue that can um, have air moving through it. The dark parts here is damaged lung. So that's what we would call consolidated lung, where the virus has gotten in there, caused damage to that lung. It's now very firm and it's no longer able to pass air through it um, and be an effective method of air exchange for that calf. On the other hand, here's the vaccinated calf and you can see nice pink lung tissue all throughout there. Um, and you know, maybe just a couple little areas where you see a little bit of dark red tissue, but for the most part, um, pretty unaffected lung compared to those calves that didn't receive the vaccine. So when we looked at all the calves across both groups and looked at the percent of lung involvement, so the percent of lung that had the, that damaged consolidated area, the calves that received pyramid are in the orange bar here. So about 35% of them had 20% or more of their lung affected after challenge. The calves that didn't receive pyramid, almost 80% of those calves had more than 20% of their lungs damaged by that viral challenge. So that was a significant difference showing that pyramid was able to prevent that lung damage caused by BRSV. Another thing they looked at was how much virus the calves were shedding out of their, their nasal um, secretion. When we have a respiratory disease outbreak go through a group of calves, one of the concerns is that they're gonna be passing it from one to the other because they're all commingled and they're probably touching noses. Um, and when we look at the calves that received pyramid, again, the orange line here, those calves had a much lower level of viral shedding compared to the calves that didn't receive the vaccine. So now not only are we protecting their lungs from damage, but we're also reducing the amount of virus that they're shedding into the environment. So, you know, you're, you're able to protect some of those calves just by decreasing the level it's being shed. Um, this is showing um, IgA antibodies. So 
what we talk about when we think about maternal colostrum is IgG. Those are antibodies that circulate through the calf's whole body. Um, you know, they're kind of the second line of defense when the virus gets in. These IgA antibodies try to keep viruses out. So they're really common in nasal passages, um, you know, the gut lining. You know, they're, they're kind of on the surface. Um, they're mucosal antibodies. And so uh, with intranasal vaccines, that's one of the things that we're trying to, to generate is this mucosal response and IgA antibodies. So previous to this study, we thought that in order to get this mucosal response with these IgA antibodies, that we needed to deliver a vaccine right there on the mucosal surface, surfaces, so right in the nose with that intranasal vaccine. But this was Pyramid, an injectable vaccine. And what we found with this was that 21 days post-vaccination, on the left-hand side, these little dots here, each dot is a calf, and these are the calves in the pyramid vaccinated group, we have a significant number of these calves that are showing IgA antibodies in their nasal secretions. So it's a really interesting finding that with an injectable vaccine, we could actually generate that IgA response. We are also getting an IgG response. So now we're getting dual protection for that calf. We're getting that IgA protection that's gonna try to keep the virus out and then we're getting the IgG protection that's going to respond to that virus if it makes it past the initial first line of defense. So this is just um, that same data in a table format. So looking at the control calves and then the ones that received pyramid by 21 days post vaccination, it was a little over half of those calves had IgA present. And by eight days post-challenge, all of those calves in the pyramid vaccinated group had IgA present. So the vaccine was able to help them mount that IgA immune response and try to keep that virus out. So how many people in here are using an intranasal vaccine? All right, several of you. So um, how many of you have heard that you want to give the intranasal vaccine because you get a quicker immune response in those calves? I see a, a few hands and some maybes. So that's kind of what we always thought when I was in vet school and when I was in practice was that, you know, if we're gonna be moving that calf, we better give it an intranasal vaccine because it's gonna be a quicker immune response. So if you look at some of the data on some enforced trials and you look at, um, so down here on the bottom is the BRSV nasal IgA titers. So same thing we looked at with the pyramid calves. And what you see is that um, on the top, you've got the controls and on the mm -hmm. bottom, the enforced vaccinated calves. There was no difference at 21 days post vaccination between the, the antibody levels, the IgA antibody levels for the calves that didn't receive the enforce and those that did. So, um, you know, what we're seeing here is that really that IgA response that we see within intranasal, um, we're not seeing a difference in those calves by 21 days post vaccination. Compared to here with Pyramid, we had over half of those calves at 21 days post vaccination um, with that IgA response compared to none of the controls. So, um, you know, we don't have a head to head comparing that IgA response with Enforce to the IgA response with Pyramid, but it's at least, um, you know, about the same duration of time after vaccination to get that Im immune response. So, you know, we really need to think about that when we're moving those calves, when they're going to be experiencing that disease challenge. And, you know, in my experience, giving an injectable vaccine to, a, you know, four to six week old calf in a hutch is going to be a little bit easier than wrangling and trying to get an intranasal in. Plus, we're gaining that additional IgG protection for those calves. Um, this is just showing that in that study, they looked at the, um, this is kind of a non-specific response, and 
we saw a really great non-specific immune response in those calves that had received pyramid compared to the ones that didn't. So that's BRSV and pyramid. And early on, I mentioned BVD and those calves, the, you know, that survey data that showed that not a lot of those calves are getting BVD protection early in life. So, um, you know, pyramid and pyramid five plus pre-spawns as well as express are proven to protect those calves against BVD. We did a very similar study, which I'll go through and, um, and show you here in a minute with BVD challenge as well as the BRSV one. So when we think about BVD, this virus is going to impact the whole herd. BVD is really great at suppressing the immune system. So even if we've had really great cholesterol antibody transfer, we've got a solid vaccination protocol that is hopefully generating immunity. If we get BVD into the herd, that's gonna just lower that immune response pretty significantly. It's gonna suppress it and you're going to see some disease challenges there. Um, I've seen groups of calves where BVD gets in there and you get respiratory disease that doesn't respond to antibiotics, the calves are kind of poor doers, and it can really have an impact across the whole herd. Um, we can see stillborns, respiratory disease, reproductive issues, diarrhea, and then some of these animals are gonna die as well. So our main source of transmission with BVD is what we call persistently infected calves. So these are calves that are just constantly shedding virus. Um, and our main goal is to eliminate that PI calf because it's going to be uh, shedding virus and exposing animals within the herd. Um, but we can also, if we're bringing calves onto the farm and they've been exposed to BVD, they could be shedding it as well. And so when calves are being commingled, this could be a potential opportunity for exposure. This is our website where we look at um, BVD um, cases that we've monitored around the U.S. And so um, Ohio is gray because we haven't had any cases submitted from Ohio yet, but um, if you ever come across one, let Greg or I know and um, we can send that in for typing because there's, there's three main types of BVD that are going to cause disease in our calves. 1B is by far the most common, about 72% of those samples that are represented on this, um, this map here have been caused by 1B. So before I go into the study on pyramid protecting against that BVD virus, are there any questions so far? All right, it's after lunch. It was a really nice big meal. It's warm in here. <laughs> I'm lulling you all to sleep. <laughs> My husband called last night, it was about 10 o'clock, and I said, oh, you, you're lucky you called right now because I was almost asleep. And he said, yep, and I know exactly what's gonna put you to sleep the rest of the way, it's hearing my voice. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I'm not lulling all of you to sleep this afternoon. Um, so this study was looking at the ability of pyramid to protect calves against a BVD challenge. And again, we were looking at those calves that had maternal antibodies present. So, you know, the goal of these studies was to say, okay, if we have the best case scenario, we have a well-managed herd that does a great job with colostrum delivery, and those calves have maternal antibodies present, can we still get them to generate an immune response by giving them a modified live vaccine. So in this study, um, we actually had three treatment groups. We had um, group one calves that received colostrum with no BVD antibodies. So these were kind of our negative controls. They didn't get any BVD antibodies from colostrum. They didn't get a vaccination that contained uh, BVD virus, BVD antigen. Group two, these calves received colostrum with BBD antibody, and they were vaccinated with pyramid five. So these are our calves that had maternal antibodies present, and then they're getting a vaccine that 
we're trying to show that these antibodies are not interfering with this vaccine. And then group three, those were our positive controls. Those were calves that did receive colostrum with BVD antibody, and they received uh, basically a saline injection. They um, vaccinated those calves between four and five weeks of age. So again, they were about the same age as the study where we challenged them with BRSV. But in this study, they waited until seven months post-vaccination to challenge them with BVD. What they found in this study is that um, in group one, so these were calves that had no vaccine, but they got colostrum, they had about a 33% death loss, no death loss in the calves that received pyramid and colostrum, and about 50% death loss in the group that had uh, no vaccine and no colostrum. So they also saw higher clinical scores in the controls on days 11 through 16 post-challenge. So um, you know, when they looked at those calves, they looked at rectal temperature, respiratory scores, nasal discharges. Those calves that did not receive pyramid had um, more clinical signs than those that had received the vaccine. We also saw a positive weight gain advantage at 14 and 21 days post challenge. So if you remember back to Geneva's presentation earlier and what an advantage that additional average daily gain can have in terms of first lactation performance. Now, if we combine that higher plane of nutrition with an excellent vaccination protocol that's going to help those calves maintain or gain weight in the face of a disease challenge, it's going to put us further ahead when they reach that first lactation. So these are just some graphs that show the same results that I, I just showed on those text slides previously, um, but this is looking at mortality in those groups. So the green bar is the pyramid vaccinated calves. You can see we had no mortality in those pyramid vaccinated calves compared to uh, over 30% with the negative controls. So those are the ones that received uh, no antibodies in colostrum and no vaccine. The positive controls, about half of them. They had mortality at about 50%. So this is that weight gain data that I mentioned. So this is 14 days post challenge. The pyramid calves, you know, their, their weight gain was kind of flat, but that's a whole lot better than um, the pounds lost in these calves here. Um, you know, 60 pounds lost in the group one calves, so those are the negative controls. The um, other controls that received the BBD antibodies in their colostrum, it was pretty close, about 55 pounds lost um, in that 14 days post-challenge. Now these are calves that were challenged about seven months post-vaccination, so we're looking at about eight-month-old animals, so that's why these, you know, pounds lost or gained those numbers seem really big when we're thinking about that month old calf, but these animals would be about eight months old at this time. Um, when we look at 21 days post challenge, both of the control groups kind of gained back some of that weight, not so much here with this group, but um, you know, they started gaining back, but they're still in the, the pounds lost side of this graph, whereas the pyramid calves are actually starting to gain now. And so, you know, either maintaining or gaining body weight in the face of a, a significant respiratory disease challenge and the advantages that that can provide us in terms of long-term productivity in these animals, it's pretty important. So the big question now becomes how is Pyramid able to still generate this immune response in these calves even though they have maternal antibodies on board? So Pyramid has um, an adjuvant or a carrier system called Metastim. And what this Metastim adjuvant does is when you mix the two vials together, you've got your, you know, the bottle with the cake in it and then the bottle with the liquid. And when you mix those two together, you get these little droplets that form. And the droplets are going to have the vaccine particles, the virus particles on the surface, but they're also contained within that droplet. If we have maternal antibodies present, they're gonna come along and they're still going to bind 
to the vaccine particles that are on the surface of that droplet. So it's not that the maternal antibodies aren't recognizing the virus that is being presented to them um, through this vaccine, but they're just attaching to the ones on the surface. We still have all these little vaccine particles contained within the droplet. So there's immune cells that'll show up and they'll pick that up and try to break it down. And when they do, it breaks that complex open and exposes these vaccine particles. And then the CAPS immune system has another opportunity to see those virus particles from the vaccine and mount an immune response. So kind of a neat little trick. It's kind of like a Trojan horse effect, uh, Trojan horse delivery of vaccine virus. So if you go on YouTube, you can, um, you can search Metastim and you'll find this little video here. There we go. So just a neat little video there that gives a little bit more background on how that vaccine works. And they talked about in the video how if there's existing antibodies, then you know it's going to give another opportunity for that cap to respond to those virus particles even after the, the vaccine particles on the surface have been neutralized. And so Pyramid is a single dose vaccine that we can use in these calves. And you know, if they don't have maternal antibodies, that um, that metastem adjuvant almost acts as a built-in booster for those calves because the immune system is going to see the surface particles and then it'll have a second opportunity to see the, the virus particles that are embedded in those droplets. So just in summary here, for protecting calves against those respiratory disease challenges uh, with Pyramid, when we vaccinate calves in that four to five week old time period, we saw a reduction in clinical signs and mortality following a BBD challenge, a reduction in lung lesions after a BRSV challenge, stimulation of that mucosal immunity, that really important IgA response that's going to be the blocker of that virus from being able to get into the calf's lungs, and um, also a protective immune response against BBD and BRSV, even when we have maternal antibodies um, present. So, you know, those maternal antibodies are really important, so we want them to be there. But with um, Pyramid and Metastem, we actually have an opportunity to work with those maternal antibodies to provide additional protection to that calf. So just to wrap up here, um, I've just got this, this last slide on developing a protocol for your herd and some steps to doing that, kind of some best practices. So the first thing really is to consult with your veterinarian. Think about what disease challenges are present on your farm, which things you're really wanting to focus on protecting those calves against. If there's, um, you know, if there's something new going on compared to what you've had in the past, you may need to do some diagnostics. Um, and so in that consultation with your veterinarian, you're going to determine the age for greatest risk and then make sure that those vaccinations are being administered, you know, 30 days at a minimum um, prior to that disease challenge so that we give that calf an opportunity to respond to the vaccination and have a protective immune response. And then select your vaccines based on herd history, plus or minus any diagnostics that your veterinarian may recommend. Training employees on administration is a really important piece of protocol compliance. And not only the how to give the vaccine, but the why. So, um, you know, there are some studies that have been done at different universities looking at the impact of employee training and protocol compliance. And they found that the employees are much more likely to follow through with the tasks that are assigned if they understand why they're doing something, not just how to do it. So, you know, we're giving this injection to the calf so that it's protected against a, a respiratory disease challenge uh, when we move them into the group heads or, you know, whatever the, the why is for the task that they're being trained to do. And then, um, you know, I think it's been mentioned several times already today. If you're not monitoring it, you can't manage it. So, 
Um, you, want to, you want to monitor the administration of these vaccines, whether that's in your paper farm records or computer farm records, to ensure compliance and make sure that those calves are receiving their vaccines according to protocol and on an appropriate schedule. So just to summarize all of that really quickly, um, Pyramid 5 and Pyramid 5 plus pre-spawns can achieve an immune response in young calves even in the face of maternal antibodies. A robust vaccine protocol that's tailored to your farm is going to be an important component to calf health. It's not going to be uh, everything. Management is going to be a really big component of that as well, um, but management cleanliness, nutrition, all of those things combined with a solid vaccination protocol is going to ensure the health and productivity of your calves. Um, and good management and husbandry along with protocol compliance are going to be your keys to heifer raising success. References and any questions you all have? Yeah, right back here. So are you saying we should uh, give labor to like or straight birth then? Yeah, so the question is related to um, timing of nasal gen or intranasal vaccines. A lot of farm protocols, if there's, um, will have a nasal, intranasal vaccine given to calves either at birth or shortly after. Um, you know, pyramid's not going to be something we'd put at, in a calf that's a day or three days old. Um, you know, so if your veterinarian has determined that a very early intranasal is going to be the best fit for your farm for preventing early respiratory disease in those calves, um, I leave that alone. What I'm looking at and, uh, you know, our focus here with this is really looking at that calf that's four to six weeks of age, still in the hutch, but you know, somewhere between two and four weeks prior to that group move or move to group pens and coming in with this modified live to increase our BVD protection and then provide more robust protection against those other respiratory viruses. Yeah, that was a great question. What size dose is it? Size dose, it's a two cc dose. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, how many, oh, how many doses per, per doses bottle? per bottle? So we've got a 10 dose bottle and then there's a 50 dose. And what's your time limit once you mix them? So with any modified live, they should be administered within about an hour, max two hours after mixing. So, um, you know, my dad has, he doesn't milk cows anymore. He raises Holstein steers and he'll get groups of like 15. It doesn't work real well when I've got a 10 dose bottle. So he'll have, you know, I'll do those 15 and then maybe do five in the other group to kind of booster them or, you know, so that that doesn't go to waste. But yeah, it's a, a 10 dose bottle. So do you need a follow up booster in two weeks? So the question is if you need a follow up booster in two weeks. So Pyramid is labeled as a single dose. Uh, the only caveat to that is that if they're under three months of age, they need another dose after another dose of a modified live after three months of age. So a lot of herds I work with will give pyramid at four to six weeks of age to that pre-weaned calf. And then their next dose they'll see will be somewhere around four to six months of age after they've moved into the group pen. Um, you know, a lot of people will move calves through at about that four to six month time frame um, and give a clostridial and a modified live. So they'll get another dose then, and then that'll carry them through to that pre-breeding dose. So. No, do, no booster within two weeks of giving this is required. How long would you say the maternal antibodies are present in the calf? It's a great question. So the question was, how long are those maternal antibodies present in the calf? And um, you know, we had a couple questions earlier where the answer was, well, it, it depends, right? So it's going to depend on what was the level of antibodies to begin with. Um, and it also depends on the virus that we're talking about. So those two studies that I mentioned, the BRSV study and the BVD study, the BRSV study, those calves were challenged about 70 days after vaccination. And the BVD, it was 217 days. 
The reason they chose those time points was that um, for the control calves, the ones that only got colostrum and didn't get the vaccine, they waited until the antibodies had dropped below a protective level so that they knew that the calves that were being challenged didn't have protection from colostral antibodies. So with the BRSV calves, it took about two and a half months for those antibodies to drop below a protective level. For BVD, it took about seven months. So it really depends on the virus that we're talking about and then also the quality of the colostrum, how much was there to begin with. So the pyramid, um, we uh, do a computer feeder and a group feeding for our kids. Our own feeder at like around seven days old, would that be too young to be used as a pyramid? Because I know you were saying like four weeks or so. So that probably wouldn't be a good fit for going on a computer feeder and group feeding. Yeah, seven days would be a little, you know, there's no age restriction on pyramid, but seven days would be a little younger than what I would be going in with a, an injectable modified live in those calves. Um, you know, you certainly could come in, you know, cover them, either, you know, count on colostrum to protect those calves very early on. Um, you know, an intranasal may be a good fit for that system. Right now, we do uh, colostrum and along with yeah so you know I still would recommend when those calves get to about a month of age because I imagine you're going from a, a that group feeder and then once they're weaned off of that then they're going into a larger group they go from the feeder through um, they stay the same group for three weeks so they yeah. uh, have four feeder pads so as they move through, we stay at that until uh, three months old. Around three months, then they go to uh, 30 to 40 kids. So basically, farm them together. But, mm -hmm. but that's so be like, you know, it's, yeah, 60 days up till three months, they stay in their 22 kids group. And like that. Okay. Yeah, so you know, you'd want to time that modified live probably before that next group move. Um, when we think about that bell-shaped curve phenomenon and those calves that are going to have a really great response and those that are going to have a poor response, some of the things that contribute to that poor response is stress, um, you know, poor nutrition, of course, but a stressed calf is really going to have a hard time mounting an immune response. So that's the main reason why I recommend getting a vaccination into those calves, you know, at least two to four weeks prior to a move. We want them to have time for the immune response response, but we also want to avoid weaning stress, movement stress, you know, things like that. Any other questions? All right. Let's get Dr. Robert. Thank you all very much.